Hey everybody, did you realize Baldur's Gate 3 was popular? You probably realized it was popular, but did you ever actually think about just how popular Baldur's Gate 3 is? A lot of people didn't really ever look at the numbers or anything like that. They never actually thought about just how popular Baldur's Gate 3 is. And that's one of the two things I want to go over in this video. The first thing is, I just want to show you some data, some numbers, and just show you how much more popular Baldur's Gate 3 is than like any other game that could possibly be labeled its category, right? The second thing I want to go over is, why is that? Why is Baldur's Gate 3 just so outrageously popular? How does a game like this continue to have so many people play it all the time for over a year now, right? And these two these two things are going to lead into each other, I assure you. So, the first thing is, Baldur's Gate 3 is popular. Do you actually realize just how popular it is? So, right here, and let's look here. This is store.steampower.com charts, Okay. This is the official Steam data. This is coming out of Valve themselves. These are the official current players. So let me give this a refresh so you guys can know I'm not like trying to load in any data or anything like that. Let me shift refresh here. This is a complete refresh of this page. You can see Baldur's Gate 3 is currently the number six most played game on Steam. Currently. This is just right now. I'm not making any of this up, okay? This game is outrageously popular. For a single player game, the numbers will simply blow your mind as to how popular this game is. I'm going to compare it to every other game in this category. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is just how popular Skyrim is. Uh, I, I will go into this later while I'm talking about Skyrim right now, but Skyrim maintains an actual outrageous player base. In fact, it, gaming as a whole has gotten more popular over time, so basically every game over time has actually slowly gotten more players. But as we can see here, now these are the Skyrim Special Editions. Skyrim has a lot of people playing it. Um, <laughs> let's just say that Skyrim is, is basically, in all honesty, one of the most popular games of all time. Of all human history, Skyrim might actually be, overall, um, the most popular single-player game ever. In fact, ever. Not multiplayer, maybe not massively multiplayer game like that, but of a single-player game, Skyrim is probably the most popular game literally ever made. Despite that, Baldur's Gate 3, even after we went through here, and, and, and let me talk about Skyrim, just to be clear here, Skyrim is capping out at like 30k concurrence, uh, 24, sorry, 23,000 today. Uh, Skyrim is, is outrageously popular. So when we look at a game like Skyrim, we can see the peak of human innovation, Todd Howard's massive achievement to mankind got us to about 30k pl people playing a 13 year old game. Which is, by the way, insane. Um, outrageous, okay? But when we look at Baldur's Gate 3, we can see that this game, even a year after launch, and I did I did cut off the early access numbers because those uh, <laughs> kind of don't do us any good here. But we can see, even a year after launch, this game, despite peaking at 875,000, has managed to maintain over 100,000 concurrent players for a year. Over 100,000 concurrent players for a year. They have patched the game. They have brought in some new endings and content and things like that. But we've stayed pretty consistent right now. Now, I do think that this will fall over time. But as I'll compare this to any other game of its category, this is simply outstanding. And I, and I, and I, and I really want to bring this up because a lot of people don't really, they don't mentalize just how much more popular this game is than any other game. Let's look at another recent game, Elden Ring. Elden Ring peaked at almost 100,000 more players than... Um, Baldur's Gate 3. It peaked at almost 100,000 more players. Despite that, it rapidly went down to numbers. Within the same year it was launched, it went down to way less people playing it than uh, Baldur's Gate 3 did. It did see some support patches, and it did do pretty good after that. It did get a DLC, and despite that, despite getting a DLC, and despite um, being a game that people would call more successful on launch, we can see here more people are still, to this day, playing... Baldur's Gate 3, at a rate of nearly 2 to 1, people are playing Baldur's Gate 3 over Elden Ring. Now, Elden Ring is a fabulous game. I'm not trying... For, for any of these games I talk about, by the way, I'm not trying to downplay them. I'm not trying to say these games are bad. I'm just trying to show the perspective here of just how popular Baldur's Gate 3 is. Because when you actually look at the numbers, you actually start thinking, oh my god, this game is outrageous. Now, Elden Ring gets a DLC, and it maintains half the player base of Baldur's Gate 3, which is just honestly truly absurd when you think about that from the perspective it's twice as popular as 
the second most popular single player experience. Like, when you look at the numbers from that perspective, right? When you look at the numbers, so you've got all these games that are like, it's like going up, 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 up. When the number one game is twice as popular as the number two game you could possibly put into its category, that is a supreme achievement. Now, even when we look at it from that perspective, when we start looking at other games that maybe could be put into the same category of single player game. Uh, I, I did make a... Um, a, a YouTube, what do you call it, a community post where I asked a bunch of people why they were playing games like this. And I got some feedback and I talked to some players about like single player games that are still popular. And here's the thing, even for single player games that are still popular, this chart here where, and, I, and yes, I do agree this will go down. Even for this chart, we can see other games will slowly fall off. Even Satisfactory, which again is an amazing game, slowly falls off. And Satisfactory is meant to be way more replayable, meant to be way more time crunching. Well, actually, Baldur's Gate 3 is a very long game, but you get the idea. I mean, Baldur's Gate 3 and Elden Ring are a very good comparison, in my opinion, because they're both about the same duration and are both meant to be replayable and are both meant to have, like, different builds and playstyles and things like that, bringing them up, right? So I think it's I think it's a good idea to compare these games. When you compare these games, you can see Baldur's Gate 3 just maintains a monumental lead. Even games like Satisfactory, which, yes, over time will slowly um, start to go down to a lower player count. Um, these games cannot keep up. And, and Satisfactory, amazing game. I, I, I do intend to put more time into Satisfactory if you guys want to see videos or stuff like that. I, I do intend to go to Satisfactory. I'm a renaissance man. I do a little bit of everything. I do want to put time into this, but I'm also one man, so I can only do one thing a day. But games like Stardew Valley, this is another game. By the way, uh, if anything, Stardew Valley and Baldur's Gate 3, I, I want to make a, a small little aside here. Making games that appeal to, to, to women does seem to have a very large player base just a little thought right there um but we can see stardew valley which is another like kind of premier very very good single player game meant to be replayable now outside of its current peak because you know to be fair it did it did do a very large patch its player count will go you know down over time um but it, it's doing quite good right now stardew valley stardew valley over time averaged like 40 to 50k people, right? Very good game, this Stardew Valley. But once again, we can see Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, even if Baldur's Gate 3 goes down, even if it goes down to like... I mean, we, we can see a 24-hour peak of 80k right now. But, you know, over time, um, including weekends, that number actually averages higher. Uh, that's why these numbers right now are, are, are still higher. Because uh, when you include weekends and you include high, you know, days, vacations, things like that, uh, holidays, uh, the, the average player count will be higher. Tuesday is not the peak player count for a game right but so the only games i could find that actually were were like single player intended and had a higher player count um than uh boulder's gate was basically satisfactory i looked at terraria which another amazing game still did not have nearly the same amount i decided to compare it to other games um like let's say fallout new vegas because when you look at fallout new vegas and you look at skyrim when you look at games like this that are kind of these narrative driven single player games they do kind of reach an optimal player count and then they kind of sit there for a while as people use mods as people use replays and things like that to continue to play through the game so i do think that there's an argument that Baldur's gate might you know it's, it's going to go down a little bit from here but once mods and things like that start hitting the game it does look like the player count will average to around if i had to guesstimate here around 80k and then pretty much stay there for a very long time now, there is the exception here to this rule, and I, I do like talking about this game because it's a supreme anomaly. It, it's basically a supreme anomaly and does not make any sense. The one up-and-comer, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I joke about this all the time, but for a game that is primarily played in single-player, and I kid you not, this is true, the one up-and-comer that could dethrone Baldur's Gate 3 from being the most blatantly played game ever, ironically, is Hearts of Iron. Because Hearts of Iron is a supreme monstrosity that makes no sense and is basically a haunting piece of human history that makes no sense. Hearts of Iron currently has today on a random Tuesday more people that played it today at peak than played it on launch day. Hearts of Iron 4 might end up being the most played primarily single player game i know five to ten percent of people do play it in multiplayer so you know that is something to consider but for a game that is primarily played single player um this game is an absolute monster but even once we factor in that boulders gate 3 is is popular to say it's popular is underselling it it's twice as popular as the number two game the only games which can get close to its player count are games that are meant to be played you know, over and over, these kind of, you know, satisfactory, Stardew Valley. Yes, I know Stardew Valley 
is currently more popular, but they have a big patch that's kind of helping them a lot. Terraria. These are like, you know, and, and even when we factor in these games, we can see Baldur's Gate 3 is just ludicrously popular. I mean, let's compare it. We got multiplayer game, multiplayer game, multiplayer game, multiplayer game. This is a new launch, um, and it's Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball is an unstoppable behemoth that shows no signs of ever faltering. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I, even as a Dragon Ball fan, I, I'm just supremely amazed how popular Dragon Ball is. I mean, it, it's outrageous. Uh, Dragon Ball is like the most popular thing in human history. I swear to God, 400 years from now, I, I feel like they're gonna be making like Dragon Ball games still. 400 years from now, they're gonna have Goku fighting Raditz or some crap. I don't even know. Probably not. Probably not. But like... It blows my mind that here we are 30 years later and Goku is fighting Raditz again, right? Like it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me. Surely it's it's fan base will die off, right? Surely. But okay, so we have single player, single player, single player, si or sorry, multiplayer, 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 the one single player game, a new game, multiplayer, 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 Destiny 2 is multiplayer. I don't know why it's hidden by my preferences. I didn't do that. Multiplayer, multiplayer, Stardew Valley is the only one that can get close. Stardew Valley, Stardew Sector. So let me put in summation here. Baldur's Gate 3 is popular, which is underselling it. It is ludicrously more popular than any other game. Why is that? So we could talk about all the awards. We could talk about all the reviews. We could talk about all of that, right? But at the end of the day, even when we look at games like, uh, and, I, and I don't have it loaded up in front of me. I wish I actually did. I don't want to go search for it and like ruin the pacing of this video. But even when we go look at games like, um, some of the most highly rated single player games uh, of all time, right? Their player count will go up and then it'll slowly dip off. And they might have like three, four, five thousand concurrent players, you know, still playing them today. But, you know, there's only so much you can do in a single player game, right? There's only so much you can do. But Baldur's Gate 3 seems to break that trend and say, no, dude, there's anything you can do in a single player game. Play this game for the rest of your life. Which, okay. I mean, the, considering the only other games. That can seem to do this are games like, you know, Bethesda games with huge mods, with these open worlds, with anything you can do, the experience, right? Baldur's Gate 3 is doing good. Why is that? Let's move this video into, why is that? Why does Baldur's Gate 3 seem to have so many people playing it all the time? Now, uh, I've put a little bit of time. I put a little bit of time into Baldur's Gate in the past few days. Um, uh, 324, so I, I think I've put about 120 hours into this game in the last couple of weeks. Maybe not 100 times, maybe about 100. I put a lot of time back into Baldur's Gate 3, and it was then replaying through the game that I realized, in all honesty, I was kind of wrong. I always rated the game highly, but in my opinion, I didn't even rate the game high enough. I feel like the more you play Baldur's Gate 3, it's almost the more you get Baldur's Gate 3, which is kind of one of the points of this video. The more you understand Baldur's Gate 3, is the more you want to continue to play through it, because a lot of and, and this kind of comes into this community post I made. I made a community post. This is why I'm talking about Elden Ring and stuff, by the way. Um, I made this community post where I said, Why do you think Baldur's Gate 3 has become the most consistently played single-player game since Skyrim? Completely dwarfing Elden Ring's peak numbers. Some people didn't like that I said that, but, I mean, it is it is dwarfing Elden Ring's numbers. I, I meant that to say... <coughs> sorry. I meant that to be like, Here's this massively popular game, Elden Ring, and Baldur's Gate is just double that right and to be clear by the way to be clear um i i did look at this too the budget for boulders gate 3 is very large at 100 million um but even when you factor in that very large budget of 100 million we're not approaching um we're not approaching the budget of games like elden ring elden ring's budget was about 200 million now some people say even up to 500 million so even if even if we even if we factor in that Baldur's Gate three had a budget of a hundred million, even if we say that was underreported, it might have been two hundred million. We're we're still this is a triple A game that is getting that's very much smaller than these other triple A games like Elden Ring, right? Uh, and and by the way, one thing this is kind of a little aside here. One thing I do want to say: Skyrim is much cheaper of a game than you ever think. Uh, if you ever want to blow your mind, look at the amount of developers and look at the budget of Skyrim because it is so much smaller than you possibly think. Don't even take my word for it. Just go look it up because it will actually blow your mind. Look at the amount of developers that, that made a game like Skyrim. Then look at the amount of developers on a game even nowadays like Elden Ring and Baldur's Gate 3 because I, I assure you, 
um, it will blow your mind. Now, I'm not trying to defend modern Bethesda or anything like that. Um, I'm just trying to say Skyrim is truly the pinnacle of human creation, okay? So, um, I did ask a question. I'm interested in, in what keeps you playing it over and over, that it maintains such an insane player count for a single-player game. Now, I did read through all of these, and a lot of people said things like, it's a complete package, well done. Um, it's a complete, entire complete, well done package for the box price. Sorry, I sometimes have issues reading. Uh, role playing is fun, voice acting is great, and it's some cinematic moment, fun to experiment with builds, blah, 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 blah. Um, this guy, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make this like an anti Elden Ring thing. Um, you have so many different ways to experience a game in actual role play. Um, this game is pretty linear and a cool story, but this is such a varied amount of dialogue classes and micro outcomes that blah, 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 blah. Do you guys get the idea here, right? Basically, every response, and I did read through all of them. So if I ever put up a community post, make sure to read a comment or put up a comment or anything like that. Oh, by the way, if you're still in this video, make sure to like and subscribe. I have to say that because it actually does massively improve me. Uh, sorry, I, I know I saw that every single time. I get annoyed when other YouTubers do it, but... Everyone who says this part right here where they go on to explain that it actually is very helpful, they are right. If you say like and subscribe, you get a lot more likes and you get a lot more subscribes. And also leave a comment down below. These things all help you, right? But anyway, I, I do read through all these comments when you guys... When, when I put up community posts, I'm actually, like, asking you guys. I'm not just, like, trying to, like, farm interactions. I actually sit there and read through the comments, like, all day because uh, I'm actually interested. That's why I reply to so many of them, because I'm actually reading through them all. That's why, I like, I don't, like, do these, like, likes manually. I actually went through each and every one of these. Uh, this is kind of like... My, when, when I put this in um the... Okay, I, I know this is a bit off topic. When I put this in my YouTube dashboard, when I put this uh, love comment, that actually removes it from my comment queue, which means it doesn't show up as a new comment anymore. Uh, I actually use that kind of, like, I've read this comment now. Okay, so uh, where even was I? Right. The, the thing a lot of people like about Baldur's Gate 3 is that it's very replayable, that you can continue to go through it on many different things. And the more I played it recently, the more I realized just how true that was. Now, I'm not even talking mods. I'm just talking the base game. So, let's go through here. The, I'm going to call this, like, the Baldur's Gate... What's even the right way to put this? Sorry, I'm going to bomb you guys with light, okay? I'm not sorry. You know what you did. So, let's call this, like, the Baldur's Gate 3... I'm not sure what I'm going to call it. You start your character, right? And then you have origins. Okay. So you start your character, and then you go into many different origins. Do you guys see that? Now, a lot of people don't realize that these origins can dramatically alter the game. One thing a lot of people don't realize is Dark Urge is actually a completely custom character. Dark Urge is the intended canon route of the game. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything here, so I'm just going to say it ties a lot into Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. And is very much intended to be the story mode of the game. However, the reason that they didn't put it as the default origin is much like how in Skyrim that your character could have the background, you know, in, in, in Skyrim and other such games, you have a background that, let's say in Fallout New Vegas, you, you already were a courier. You already had a past. You already did things like that. The developers didn't want the player to have a preset background. They wanted them to be able to roleplay anything they wanted. So that's why the origin, the default one, has no background, very few special options. They're a completely blank character for you to project yourself on. Dark Urge, on the other hand, has a background. He has a story. Um, you can define how you play the character. You can define how you decide to interact with your background. And it's a, it's a, for those of you guys who haven't done it because you think it's like a predefined background, I assure you it's very open to interpretation it's very open to how you play the character it's very much like you woke up in a body i think that's the best way to put it your character is very much going to wake up in a body that's already existed and it's up to you as to how you role play through that you don't have to role play one way you don't have to role play another you don't have to role play evil good anything it's very interesting and i highly recommend it because a lot of people think that the dark urge is a predefined character that you have to play a certain way and it's just that's not how it is and I very much think that you guys should, if you haven't played through it, you should do it. But anyway, so you got your, you got your start, right? And, and in Baldur's Gate 3, you got your start. So, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as I can to not be annoying about it. You've got six different origin characters. Now, when you're playing an origin character, you play as this actual character. They will, of course, have their default race, default sub-race, class, background, uh, their abilities. You can change your abilities for yourself, but um, origin characters, these are the actual characters. They're not... They, they will have unique options, they will have unique dialogues, but you do play as a character. So you can start off, and then you can do different choices. To decide to play 
as a default character, just the blank tab? Do I decide to play as an origin character or do I decide to do Dark Urge? Already, you've got three different choices that can impact the story. For those of you guys who don't believe me, each of these different things can impact the story. While you can go through the origin character's story um, by having them as a companion and having them around you, you can also go through their story and get unique dialogue choices, unique cutscenes, and things like that by playing the character yourself. Yes, that's a true. For a lot of people who don't get it, you actually can play through... Um, these characters and get unique different dialogues and play them out in a slightly different way dark urge likewise gets a different backstory he's kind of the intended route if we want to put it that way so if you want to experience the full story of boulders gate 3 if you want to understand every bit of background of what the actual story you you can't understand what the actual story was for the most part but let's say dark urge is filling out that last five percent you understand 95 percent of the story but that last five percent that's dark urge now, once you do that, of course, you've got your, your race. So, I decided to go over here. I decided to go Dark Urge. Now, once I go Dark Urge, we branch out a little bit more. So, now, of course, I've got my different races. And each of these will branch out as well, but I'm just doing this to show a point. And each of these different races can impact the game in different ways once again. Some races are more equal than others. So, for example, if you play a Drow, you will get a lot more dialogue options. And you'll get a lot more choices to make than if you play, let's say, a half or is someone who plays a lot of half orc they kind of did their best and and sometimes you get a half orc moment and sometimes characters will comment on it and talk to you but let's just say when you play as a drow you're more equal than if you play as let's say a dragon boy now once you go here you do of course have your race features you've got your sub races which can impact your game um you can get different resistances to different damage types who play dragonborn if you play as a dwarf you'll randomly nerf your movement speed for no advantage Please, please, please undo the movement speed reduction on small characters. It really sucks. I, I really actually find it quite annoying. Uh, but you can choose different builds. And this is where the game gets into builds. This is what I'm talking about, builds. So I can decide to be a shield dwarf. When I play a shield dwarf, I get armor proficiency with light and medium armor. Is that worth it? Absolutely not. You would just rather play a githyanki. Because they also get light and medium armor. And they don't nerf their movement speed. Once again, please unnerf dwarf movement speed. I really want to play a dwarf. Okay, I really just want to play a stocky boy here, but uh, you can play Dwargar, Gold Dwarf, Shield Dwarf. Now, of course, if you play Dwargar, there are Dwargar in the game. You can talk to them, and you can do lots of different dialogue choices. If you want to, you could actually play Dwargar, an evil Dwargar. Dwar am, I, am I pronouncing this right? Dwargar are, by default, pretty evil, um, but they don't have to be evil. You could roleplay a good Dwargar. And, of course, then you have your class. In each of these classes, these uh, 12 different classes, some people say that you can categorize them into different things. Yes. For the most part, I would say that you can categorize the three different classes into three different play styles. Well, let's say maybe four different play styles, if you want to put it that way. You got your melee damage, your range damage, your damage spellcaster, and your support spellcaster. For the most part, you can put them into each of those different categories. But, of course, people will come to me, and they'll say... Well, that's stupid. No, you can't really do that, because what if I'm playing a paladin? If I'm playing a paladin, I have my oath. I have to keep my oath. I use my abilities differently. I, I keep smite. I do things like that. What about a rogue? What if I do a rogue? I could do a rogue, a subclass for a rogue. I could do assassin rogue and things like that. And for those of you who don't really believe me that these can be very different, let me just, as one example, let me show you. Um, once I choose paladin, what do I do? Of course, I Google Paladin, Boulder's Gate 3, and I open this website. Once I open this website, I then decide, okay, so I've got different subclasses. Uh, we got Paladin subclasses, Oath of Ancients, Oath of Devotion, Oath of Vengeance, Oath Breaker. Ooh, maybe I could play an Oath Breaker, or maybe I could try to keep my Oath. And let's say I decide I want to roleplay a Druid Paladin. I mean, they're not literally a Druid, but they're like a very Druidic kind of people. They want to preserve the sanctity of life and the beauty of nature. And you need to keep your Oath. And you can see down here, you don't need to spoil yourself, but if you do, you can see you can break your Oath all these different ways so if you ever kill a non-hostile even by accident um enemy npc you will of course break your oath you cannot kill non-hostile creatures even creatures that you killed by accident these will break your oath you swore an oath 
to not do damage to harm to to innocent people even if an npc steps on your moonbeam or your spike growth that's on you you should have thought about that you're a paladin you swore an oath your oath gets breaking you become an oath breaker does this change your game that much beyond just how you break your oath yes actually yes it very much does see because you get all these different things here um you get all these different things at the different levels. For example, um, if we go to level 3, I get different spells for being each different Oath. Oathbreaker is kind of like a Warlock Paladin. Oath of Vengeance is kind of like a Damage Paladin. Oath of Devotion is like a Tank Paladin. Oath of Ancients is kind of like a Druish Paladin. You can see here they kind of get, they could speak with animals as a ritual, which is very useful. Uh, Oath of Ancients at level 3 can just permanently talk with animals for the rest of the game. Oath of Devotion gets lots of ways to be tanky. They, uh, I mean, that's basically it. Oathbreaker gets lots of ways to do damage and kind of cast warlock spells, things like that. As you continue to progress, you get different oaths, oath, oath. You get the, uh, or sorry, different auras based on your oath. What I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to do in, in lesser words is that Paladin is a very different way to play the game than if I just wanted to be fighter. Both of them are going to run up and hit people with two-handed great swords for the most part. But when I decide to play one over another, I could end up playing the game very differently. If I so was inclined, I could play Gold Dwarf, and I could try to maximize my hit points, and I could try to play Gold Dwarf Paladin with an Oath of Devotion in order to be the tankiest little tank to ever tank Tankland. You can see here that I almost have as much HP per level as an actual Barbarian would have, coming up at 13 health per level. This dude would be quite tanky. And of course, my class action is to deal damage to anyone who deals damage to me. So I could end up being a very tanky dude who just tanks a lot. I'm just outrageously tanky. I run up and I hit people. If they hit me, I blow them up. And uh, that's just a different way to play the game. So we can see here, once again, we choose our origin. We choose our race. We choose our class. Once we choose um, our class, of course, that goes into multiple different ways to play the game. So we choose our class, then we choose our uh, subclass again. And now that we've got our subclass, we still have different ways to play the game. And do you see how here all this all goes out here like this? Because although one of these choices doesn't impact the game much on its own, choosing one race over another race, right? Choosing one sub race over another race. O although individually this might not impact the game a lot, it could actually impact the game a lot. Because I decide one day, you know what, I just want to play a Dwargar, because once Dwargar level up, they get a free, uh, free ability to cast Enlarge on themselves. Now, here's the thing, you're thinking to yourself, Enlarge, how could that really impact the game? Well, let me tell you how that can impact the game. I want to play a Dwarf, I want to play a Dwargar, I want to choose a Barbarian. Why do I want to choose a Barbarian Dwargar? Because Barbarians are good at throwing people. Barbarian Berserkers are good at throwing people, and if I enlarge myself, I can throw even larger enemies. That's right, if I play a Dwarger Barbarian, I could throw mid-sized, I could throw human enemies before I reach strength 20. This could allow me to, well, to, it allows me to throw people, and that's funny. I like throwing people. I like WWE my enemies, okay? It's just funny to me, and you can do that, and that's just something that's in the game. You can just do that, and although, again, that's what I'm trying to say here, is although any of these individual choices don't seem... Uh, to those of you who don't play the game, this might not seem like the biggest deal. What I'm trying to say here is each of these choices adds up. Now, you do have backgrounds. Uh, Dark Urge has a unique background. As a custom character, you can choose a background. I won't lie to you. These aren't going to change the game that much. They give you different skills, uh, but for the most part, it's not going to impact the game that much. If you have a different origin, this could very much impact the game. So if I'm playing the Will origin, um, I'm going to play Will, and Will is a warlock, and warlocks do... Well, they're warlocks, right? But I can then decide to play Will in a different way throughout the game. So although this choice here, this different origin choice, for those of you who might not play the game, you might not think, how do you? How did you put 300 hours into Baldur's Gate 3? Didn't you play it a few times? Well, because maybe I want to decide for my next run I want to play Warlock. And what better way to play Warlock than to play Will? On his own, Will is kind of a boring character, generally considered the least interesting origin character, generally. But maybe if I play Will, I can make Will do interesting options. Maybe I could roleplay him as evil Will. I'm in control of him, so maybe Will is now evil in my run. Maybe Will is just super good. Maybe Will decides to make good choices. Maybe I'm playing an honor mode, which is something um, I'll talk about in a little bit. But I'm playing an honor mode, which is effectively Iron Man mode. Maybe Will fails to save 
well, I don't want to spoil it too much, but maybe Will fails to save someone important to him. Or maybe Will decides to kill someone important to him. Those are choices that I could make, and I maybe just want to see how the game plays out. Maybe I just want to see what happens in the game. Which brings me to another thing I want to talk about. The same general idea, but the story. I did see a comment down here um, when I was looking through this, and I, and I disagreed a lot with this comment. Nothing. I played a full walkthrough a couple of times to understand all the roleplay and variety is an illusion. Same map, same goals, different dialogues that lead to the same consequences. The only real choice is with Gale. Blah, 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 blah. Basically, this guy's comment here, and some people agreed with him. I ended up liking it because I, I liked that he responded, right? But I didn't really like the response itself, but that's fine. You don't upvote and downvote based on whether or not you like the comment, right? You upvote and downvote whether or not they brought something interesting to the conversation. But this is what I always disagree with that. Although the same general story will play the same way out every single time. You got your Act 1. Your Act 1 goes into Act 2, which goes into Act 3, and then you finish the game, right? I didn't like that line. Let's let's make this a better line. For the most part, people will see the game playing out like this. But this is not, in my opinion, how the game actually plays out the more and more you play it. Many different actions can happen. And especially, here's what I would recommend honor mode, which I will talk about here for a second. Honor mode adds much more difficult bosses. And importantly, it makes you play on Iron Man, which means you only play with one save. You cannot take multiple saves. And it will automatically save on basically every action. Of course, you can find ways to cheat honor mode, but the right way to play honor mode is honorably. This means if you fail to save someone, if you get a bad dice roll, if you forget about something for a second, you can't load an old save. You can't just load back up. No, that's just how your things go. If you forget to save someone, if you do something in the slightly wrong way, if you make a misplay, if the dice are just against you and a bad thing happens, honor mode can make choices. Although you can play the game in a definitively this is the best route these are all the best choices i remember to do everything you can play the game in a very different way for example in act one you want to save certain people and you've got right here you move out and you save these certain people but depending on what choices you made and who you do save in totality there's actually slightly different things you can do with slightly different dialogue choices that will very much impact this thing now these groups of people the tieflings let's call it that uh because it's not really a spoiler tieflings are in act one right the tieflings in Act 1, very much most people save them, right? But depending on some dialogue choices and depending on what you do, it can set up Act 2 differently. Your tieflings could just be dead right here. You could kill the tieflings, or you could forget, or you could make a wrong choice, and or maybe you just intentionally do it. The tieflings could just have their story wiped out pretty early on, but they could also continue this story into Act 2. But here's the thing, even once the tieflings continue their story into Act 2, you also need to make choices in Act 2. Now here's the thing, these tieflings are not important to the main story, and there's a lot of things like these tieflings, I assure you. There's things like the Deep Drow, there's um, there's just so many to list through. There's things like Halson's story, there's a lot of things which can impact the story going into Act 2. Three, in addition to all the different origin characters, depending on how, what you do with the origin characters, the game can play out maybe not in huge different sweeping strokes, but it can play out in many different minor ways that could make you frustrated or annoyed if you don't do things in a way that benefits you. But if you're playing an honor mode, which I maybe wouldn't recommend for your first run, but if you're trying to replay through the game, you might replay it and you might go, oh crap, I forgot to do that oh no, that's going to make a different character do a different option, and then things play out differently. For example, let me, let me tell you this, and I, I can't, I'm not like a huge editor, so I assure you, uh, if I could show you the moment I could, if I, I would if I could, right? There's a moment in Act 3 where you get accosted by the guards, and I'd happened to make some choices with the Deep Gnomes, because I just kind of like the Deep Gnomes, and I brought them all the way through. I helped them in Act 1, I helped them in Act 2, and I brought them all the way into Act 3. I expected to never really see them again, even though they do play a big part in Act 3 again, but I expected to never see them in Act 3. And we were accosted by the guards, and it was kind of a bad moment. I'd taken a bad dialogue choice because I hadn't been there before. And the Deep Gnomes... They run up and they they save you from the guards. And it was my pointing at the screen moment where I was like, oh, oh, oh. And it was really cool because I think for a lot of people, they might not see that moment. They might not make that exact choice in that exact way, get accosted by the guards, make the wrong choice, blah, 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 blah. They might not go in that exact specific route to see that exact moment where you get saved by those people you thought weren't going to show up again. Which is why I disagree with that comment, by the way. The game might have the same story beats, beat for beat. 
you might not be impacting the larger story as it exists, but you're impacting all these different secondary stories, do you see? So even though the tieflings might play out different ways, or sorry, even though the main story might play out the same way, the tieflings could play out very differently. You need to make more and more choices on the tieflings. The tieflings might go very differently into Act 3, although in many ways they might get into Act 3 with the majority of their characters, or they might get into Act 3 with you know some of the important characters who might not notice it. In other runs, you might give it 100% and notice that their characters of the tieflings who get all the way into act three that you think oh wow if you do all these choices and you do all these things you can get certain characters all the way into act three and sure they're not going to impact the game in a huge different way but it can be interesting to just have that pointing at the screen moment where you go oh oh i didn't expect to see him again and he shows up and you're like oh i've never seen this before and I, I promise you, every time I play through Act 3, there's always that moment for me where I go, Oh, I didn't expect to see that again. And it shows up, and this is every single time. I'm sure it's not only for the Tieflings. There's all these different plot points. And there's all these different things. And there's a lot of them. Each of the different origin characters. Except Will and Karlak, for the most part. Okay, the four main origin characters. Asterion, Lazel, Gale, and Shadowheart. Each of the four main origin characters very much have different choices that can impact the game in actually pretty large ways uh going in to act three one of them in particular could very much impact if you get into act three so you know um there's i would say there's like the main three like the super main three by the way Asterion, lazel and shadowheart depending on what you do on the background and depending on what you do with these characters you can very much impact the game in very much different ways all of the characters of course have different endings and different things you can do with them for the most part, if you like an origin character and you play through them, you'll get the good ending for the character. But even on some of them, um, and I was wrong about this, even for some of these characters, you might say, well, I, I would always get the good ending. But of course, you have the question is, you know, what what is the good ending? Even if you get the good ending, what is the moral ending to that good ending, right? And when you look at it from that perspective, you can start asking yourself, do I want to play through the game? again and and maybe i want to do it in this way maybe i want to do it in this way and this is where the game starts getting its insanity replayability as i mentioned earlier um maybe i want to go through my same choices in the same way and i just want to do it on a half elf or maybe i want to do it on a gnome maybe i just think gnomes are funny and i want to be a gnome what kind of gnome do i want to be maybe i want to be a deep gnome and maybe i want to see maybe this gives me different choices with the deep gnomes Ooh, maybe i just want to be a forest gnome maybe i'm a forest gnome and i want to be a druid and i want to see do the druids react to me differently can they talk to me differently maybe i won't get much more content after act one but maybe you know i just role play that and you do get different role play choices and you do get different uh, dialogue options depending on the class you play depending on the uh race you play so you could just go through the game again on a different class and maybe just have fun in the combat because that's a big thing is the combat it's a turn-based game and for someone who doesn't really enjoy turn-based games i definitely think they took the D, D style and added different items which is the last thing i'm going to get into here yes of course we're going to wipe this again and we're going to talk about the choices on your class okay so let's get into the last big, I'm going to call this the last big choice thing we go into, right? So of course you have your class and this goes into a bunch of different subclasses, right? Hopefully you guys believe me at the subclasses. Then once you choose your subclass, you've got your different race for that. So of course this goes, I, I'm getting increasingly lazy as time goes on. Excuse me with that one. But then here's where it starts getting very, very, very much interesting is all the different parallel choices, all the different item choices, so to speak. Now, of course, you've got your leveling options. You've got feats. You've got skills. You've got things like that. But for the most part, once you're in a certain subclass, you'll play them the same way. But of course, we have things like, and I'm just going to bring this up for a second real quick, um, armor. Why are we going to bring up armor? There's a lot of different armor in the game. There's lots of different armor in the game for different acts for different levels, for different areas you can be in. Uh, much like all these single player games, um, much like all these single player games, you can find armor that you aren't maybe intended to have. So you can kind of find some cool armor. Maybe you find some armor that's like weirdly specific and good in one very, very specific situation. So you like it because, oh man, if I use the Oak Father's Embrace in this very specific situation, it's quite good. And that could be true. If you use the Oak Father's Embrace in a very specific situation, it could be, ironically, quite good. You can find what armor, what levels you get things. And this is when you start um, 
having choices with your character, for example. So maybe armor wasn't the best way to put it, but let's say we get to um, the unwanted masterwork scale mail. There's lots of medium armor in the game that allows you to add your full dexterity modifier to your armor class. For those of you guys who maybe don't get it, you can add up to 14 dexterity into your armor if you're wearing medium armor. If you have 16 or 18 dexterity, it won't improve your armor. You can only dodge so much in medium armor. But there is some medium armor in the game, and there's a lot of these kind of medium armor, and it depends on where you find them. There are some medium armor in the game that allows you to add your full dexterity modifier. So if I was, for example, a, um, I don't know, rogue, and I was a rogue who could find my way into medium armor, maybe by being a Githyanki, or maybe by being a shield dwarf, I could be a rogue in medium armor, and I could use my full dexterity into my medium armor by using certain sets of medium armor. And this is the choices that start occurring here, because these are more, let's say, parallel choices. All these different choices are coming out at the same time, but it's on to you how you do that. Now, I don't need to use medium armor on a rogue. I could decide to use light armor. But if I decide to use light armor, which different light armor do I want? While obscured, I get plus three bonus to stealth strikes. That's pretty good. Or I could get padded armor. That just makes me tankier. Am I a rogue who runs into combat using light armor? Do I use my high dexterity? Do I use maybe padding on my armor so I can try to tank things through here? Do I try to use, um, oh, there's some pretty good ones up here. Uh, oh, over here we can see some really interesting ones that will make Spore Druids better. Will it make them good? No, don't play Spore Druid. Even with the unique Spore Druid armor, never, 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 never play Spore Druid. It's so disgustingly bad you'll actually get super frustrated. But they tried. They tried to give Spore Druid this unique, pretty cool armor. Um, over here we can see all oh, this one's pretty cool. So if you're playing a, a druid of the moon and I assure you I'm not just like I'm not just doing a bit here. These actually are impactful. So I play as a druid and I decided to make my subclass druid of the moon Which I get to choose at level three not in game uh, right now But once I level my character up to level three I would get to make that choice and I play druid of the moon and I like shapeshifting a lot This gives me 22 temporary HP every time I shapeshift and my the damage I receive is reduced by one um, while those temporary hit points are active. So every time I shapeshift into an owl bear or panther or whatever, I get a little bit of temporary HP, so it's harder to knock me out of the form, and I take reduced damage for that. And then here, I have plus two armor class, and I have advantage on saving throws against spells, and these effects persist while I'm using shapeshift. Normally when you shapeshift, you do not get your effects of your armor persisting, but this one does. So now, between this modifier and this modifier, I could end up being a druid that once I get into Act 3, once I get into the late game, might be a little bit too late to be blunt, but, uh, you know, a little bit too late to be interesting because you spend the majority of the game without it. But once I do get into Act 3, I could maybe beat the game and I could beat all these hard honor mode bosses. Because remember, honor mode, as I mentioned earlier, makes the bosses a lot tougher. How much tougher? A lot tougher. Like, a lot tougher. Um... Beating them with really bad specs is, is actually quite difficult, I'll be real with you. Uh, I, I'm not saying you need to play min-max to perfection, but you can't play like an idiot. So if you decide to do maybe challenge runs with two or three characters in your party, one of the ways you could do that was maybe with Druid of the Moon. Might not be possible to do Druid of the Moon in two-man, but maybe you're saying doing a three-man run of the game where you only have three characters. You could use armor like this to try to clear out some of those late game giga bosses that would be otherwise difficult. And that's why I want to talk about these parallel choices. Because as you continue to go through the game, you have um, all these different ways, let's say, that you can be leveling up your character and doing it in interesting ways. I'm very good at drawing. So, like, let's say in Act 1, you've got these different choices you can make parallel. In Act 2, I've got all these different choices I can make parallel to each other, right? So, um, one of the things I did... I need to go to clothing here. One of the things I did as a barbarian is I get the blood guzzler garb in act one. Whenever an enemy damages the wearer, the wearer gains wrath for one turn. So for two turns. It's one turn in honor mode, I'm pretty sure. You get a plus one bonus to damage uh, for every turn of wrath you have. So um, in honor mode, every time I get hit, I get an extra turn of wrath. So if I get hit three times, I get three turns of wrath. I do plus three damage. I played a barbarian. I sprinted up into every enemy, and I tried to let them all beat the crap out of me. They did beat the crap out of me a lot. Sometimes too much, but uh, they beat the crap out of me a lot. And then what I did is I hit them. I hit them really, really hard. And that was just funny to me. Because doesn't that sound a lot different from anything else I just described? Doesn't sound a lot different from maybe playing a half-elf 
I don't even know. Um, monk? No, half elf monk can't do that. Well, actually, maybe I could do a half elf monk like that, but it works best on barbarians because they have the most HP in the game. Do you get the idea here? So, what I'm trying to say here is a last little point here. All these choices in your class and all the difference in the combat, nothing to do with the storytelling, nothing to do with any of that. All these different choices you can make means that there are a lot of different things you can do in this game. There's a lot of different ways that things can play out. And that's why this game continues to maintain a ludicrous player base. That's why this game continues to have people with hundreds and thousands and thousands of hours in the game. Because the more you play the game, the more you realize what you can do with the game. And... Some of the things that I went over here are quite simple, to be fair. Um, some of the things I went over here are, uh, oh man, we, you know what we have to do? I, if I if I show you maybe um, helmets here real quick. Uh, so I, I, I want to, because some people who might not be paying the most attention think that these are just all stat items. Um, so here we got the Diadem of Arcane Synergy. Uh, when I inflict a condition, gain arcane synergy. Weapon attacks deal additional damage equal to the affected entity's spellcasting ability modifier. So what this helmet does is whenever I debuff an enemy, for two turns, my weapon attacks get additional damage based on my spellcasting modifier. Does that sound complicated? I need to debuff an enemy, then I need to have a high spellcasting modifier, then I need to not cast a spell but instead hit them with a melee attack. Does that sound complicated? Yes, it is. But that could also lead into a build. If I play, for example, a College of Swords uh, Bard, and I debuff a bunch of enemies on one turn, on the next turn I can then run up and stab a crap load of people and do a lot of damage. Does that sound interesting? It interested me. I had a lot of fun with that build. That was probably one of my most fun playthroughs. And I very much enjoyed it, and I would probably play through the game again on that build on its own to see a different story with that character, mind you. But therein, you get, there's so many variables and so many different things you can do in this game. Um, oh man, what's a different item I can do here? Uh, your weapon and unarmed attacks deal additional two damage when surrounded by two foes. Kind of a stat checky thing, but I'm trying to find another item here. Um, oh, this one was pretty cool. This one's really good for barbarians. This is like a great item. It was clearly intended for barbarians because I called it Horn of the Berserker. Begin a plus two bonus to attack rolls when damaging enemies that have already taken damage. You deal two necrotic damage if you don't have full life. And if you don't deal damage, you take damage. So the idea here is you can get all these interesting items, you can get all these interesting effects that boost different ways to play style. You can boost different ways to do things. It's just really cool. Let's end this video now before I rant a little bit too long, perhaps. But Baldur's Gate 3, why does it maintain such a very, very big player base? Why do I think it will continue to maintain such a big player base? All the things I just described add up. All the different ways. I could play through the same game in the same way again. I could do the same companions. I could take Asterion, Shadowheart, and Gale with me again. And I could do all their companion quests again. And I could have fun with it again. And maybe that's just my comfort food. It's just replaying the same game in the same way again. But let's say I want to change it up a little bit differently. I could either do the Dark Urge. I could change up my different subrace. I could change up my race. I could change up my class. I could do the same companions in the same way with the same items on them and then me just being different and i could have fun with it again and that's what makes this game so popular and that's what makes this game so replayable um in addition when you play honor mode it's in in one of my videos i wouldn't go back and watch it because it didn't age great i don't think any of my old content ages great every time i make something i always think i could have done that better but anyway uh one of the biggest complaints i had for this game was that it was way too easy to do a perfect run but honor mode, uh, definitely making things a bit harder. And honor mode, definitely for people with ADHD like me who forget a lot of things. Um, by only having one save and literally restricting you from loading back to an old save makes it much harder to have a perfect run. Uh, there are certain people I forgot to save in Act 2 who were turned into undead. And I thought that was funny because I'd never seen that outcome before. I thought that was hilarious. I was like, oh crap, they're dead now. And they're undead. That's a terrible fate. Which, you know, was bad for them. But it was kind of funny to me. I was like, I would never considered that because I had always saved them before. But that's really funny to me. So, uh, that's this video. That's why Baldur's Gate 3 is so popular. 
that's why I think you should try to play Baldur's Gate 3. And in all honesty, if you liked Baldur's Gate 3 and you played through it once and you thought, oh, well, that's about all I could see with the game, I'd recommend playing through it again because there's probably more you could see to this game than you even realize. So thank you all for being here. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for watching my very long rant on this game. Thank you, everybody. And as always, I hope you all have a great rest of your day.